opportunity to speak on it uh, before you. Uh, I have been asked to speak on a topic uh, which is uh, on which I am not an expert. Um, I have uh, certainly studied uh, the theology of Hinduism. I have uh, read through Bhagavad Gita many times. And uh, generally on stress management, I've always believed uh, that you give, you give stress to others but don't get stressed to yourself. <laughs> it's been my philosophy. But uh, to speak to you, I, I'm basically a trained economist. And uh, I have a PhD in economics. I've been a professor. Uh, first 10 years I was at Harvard, then I went back to India. Then I got in trouble with Mrs. Gandhi. And uh, she threw me out of IIT. Uh, so I couldn't get any other job in India. So instead of migrating, I entered politics. That's how I became a politician. <laughs> of course, the job came back to me because the courts reinstated me after 22 years. And I got all my back salary without ever doing any work. <laughs> so, uh, but I did, could not go back. By then, I had become a minister and things like that. <clears throat> so that's how I came to politics. Many of my political uh, opponents uh, hired lawyers to file cases against me, mostly defamation cases. And I didn't want to waste money uh, hiring lawyers. So I decided to learn law. And uh, although I didn't take a degree, I learned law. And for all my cases, I've had maybe 46 defamation cases against me, and I've won all of them. So now... <laughs> I am not including uh, once Mrs. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Jailalita had quite 100 cases against me, hoping that I will be just spending my life going from one court to another. And I went to the Supreme Court against it and got all 100 cases uh, dismissed in one, uh, one order. So I uh, became an expert on defamation law. And then soon uh, uh, I got into other things. So people think I'm a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, at least not an uh, enrolled lawyer in that sense. I studied law, but I did not uh, enroll myself as a lawyer. So that's how I came to law. It's uh, the periva that is uh, Jendra Saswati arrest, which made me began thinking about uh, Hinduism. And uh, why he was arrested, what was the background behind it, and when I started going, I thought now Hindus were under siege and it was invisible. So that's how I got into this whole field of Hinduism. And slowly I started writing about it and people to meet the, the objections of people, uh, particularly youngsters, that you know, now in this day and age of globalization, how can we talk about all these religious values and so on? And then I suddenly came across, I propounded a theory as to why Hindu values are essential for stabilization of globalization. And the tribute for me on this work came from Fordham University, which is a, a Christian, a Jesuit a Christian university. And the president presided over my lecture. I came specially on a one-day trip from India on 2nd June to address the uh, a select gathering uh, on Hindutva principles of economic development. And the reason I was invited is because the president said, and the head of the Department of Economics, who was also was an Indian and known to me for a long time, called uh, Rishikesh Vinod, uh, they, they felt that uh, there is a dissatisfaction that exists in society and people are looking for new ways to uh, achieve material progress without uh, the attendant misery that comes with it. And people become very rich and still become unhappy. The case of Julia Roberts is there uh, who went for a shooting to Haryana. And uh, there she saw people with uh, great serenity in their faces. So she asked somebody in the, in, the, in the set, how come these people with so much poverty are they so serene? So he, that person in the set took uh, her to a guru 
in Haryana. And he explained to her Bhagavad Gita and why people in India have sort of internalized it without realizing it. And that's what makes us uh, much more uh, uh, peaceful than, uh, or at least at peace than uh, other societies. And she came back and she converted with her entire family. She became a Hindu. Now if uh, such is the power of Hindu, Hindu thinking in a place like Haryana, you can imagine uh, if you had gone to uh, Varanasi, what would have happened? And that happened to Stephen Jobs, who produces the iPhone, the well-kept secret. Uh, he came to Varanasi and became a Hindu. And there are many such. And now there's a plethora of books which have come out. <coughs> One is called American Veda by Philip Goldberg, uh, which uh, describes how Americans are getting increasingly fascinated by Hindu, Hindu concepts and Hindu thoughts. Then, of course, you had that famous article of the editor of, one of the editors of Newsweek, Lisa Miller, I don't know how many of you saw that. Now we are all Hindus, you know, that was the title of the article. Uh, these are reproduced in my, one of my more recent books, it's not the latest book, uh, but my one of my most recent books called uh, Hindu Tva for National Renaissance, uh, which has uh, been a bestseller in India. And uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, if you get that, uh, Guru Varipan knows how to do it, you will be able to uh, see uh, all these things reproduced, what's coming in America. There is an undercurrent here uh, that somehow materialism alone will not produce happiness. Uh, that you need some value system which has to be manage with that. Even the Chinese are now beginning to talk about that. In fact, uh, the Chinese president has propounded that the American, the Chinese society will in future be a harmonious society and not a socialist society. Of course, it's not a socialist except in name, but uh, the fact is that he propounded that. And he said the reason is that when people become, some people become rich, others don't. Jealousy comes in and then this uh, recreates uh, class antagonisms and so on. So to overcome these emotions, you need values. And he said Buddhism and Confucianism are values which will tell you how to strive without being jealous. And that's why he's, uh, now he's uh, held conferences. Uh, the first, uh, after what, after almost 60, 70 years of communist rule, uh, Buddhist, international Buddhist conference was held in in Beijing. So, uh, there seems to be some consensus going on in the world. And it is in that context that I started studying religion. So, I am here uh, just to, exp as a, to explain to you how in my personal, uh, what I have learned in my personal experiences and how I apply them and how I borrow them, uh, how I trace them to the Hindu thought and thereby bring in stress management. So this is what I am, I am not speaking to you, my, my name may be Swami, but I am not a real Swami. <laughs> uh, South Indians have this Krishna Swami, Narayan Swami, etc. My father thought, why should we all have these long names, let's have just Swami. And I used to be known as S. Swami in school, but the Americans, you see, they, when I came here as a student, they said, what is this S? So I told them. So they, they, they listed me as Subramanian Swami, so I became Subramanian Swami as if, my parents have named me Subramanian uh, Swami. So, it's in this background that I have now thought that we have to translate these esoteric concepts of our tradition to a simple, understandable way for the modern generation. And uh, it is in this context that uh, I've taken a leap into the future of helping a friend to set up a new television station in Tamil Nadu uh, called Krishna TV. And I'm pleased that I'm addressing uh, a, a, my first meeting in the United States the district uh, with, uh, uh, on a, from Krishna temple. I'm here because uh, Harvard every year invites me to teach one semester, which is a compressed semester of the summer. 50% uh, of the students are Harvard students and 50% come from outside. So, uh, uh, I'm using that advantage of being anchored at Harvard to travel to different parts of the country. Um, for
first of all, that uh, Hindu religion, if it teaches you anything, it teaches you to develop a mindset. A mindset uh, which uh, uh, we would uh, call in, uh, uh, in Sanskrit as uh, um, uh, Manastiti or uh, Chiti or Chetana. Uh, these are some of the words. In Tamil you would call it Manaparme. So uh, there is uh, uh, this mindset is what the target is of all teachings. If you go to Bhagavad Gita, it is essentially that. Preparing your mind in such a way that you can meet the stresses of life. And you will, if you follow those, you will never be stressed. So I will, will therefore give you uh, some of these shlokas which are there in the Bhagavad Gita, which you need uh, a book which will rewrite it, in, uh, not in the classic Sanskrit, but in terms of the simple English. Uh, let me say why mindset is important is that most people think that numbers matter. Uh, who's got majority, who's got minority, who's in minority. Uh, or strength matters, whether you've got nuclear weapons or you've got lots and lots of billions of dollars with you. Those are the things that most people think. But if you really look at it, each of them by themselves do not constitute uh, power. There may be a thousand goats at one place and one tiger comes there. The majority is with the goats. But uh, seeing the tiger, all the goats will run away. They will not be in a situation to plan that let's surround this uh, uh, tiger and then go on kicking it till it is dead. Uh, so here is a case where majority doesn't matter. It's the, the, the mind, the immediate imagery that you create in the mind of the others that matters. So this mindset is extremely important. If you go to a circus, you will see uh, five lions in a, in a cage uh, that is being specially constructed for the show. And where one ringmaster would be usually be a short, thin, wiry guy, he will be with a whip and he will call all the lions out of their, their separate cages and they will enter the, that, uh, that arena. And then he will tell them, climb up. And each of those lions are strong enough with, the, with their paw to knock this uh, ringmaster down. Leave alone biting him to pieces or, you know, uh, or tearing him to shreds, you see. So, therefore, uh, I would say uh, that strength again is not important by itself. Because it's the mind, you see, from childhood they get hold of that cup and train it, feed it, and then ultimately starts obeying. It doesn't know its true instinct. It doesn't know its true strength, it doesn't know its true potential. So, why I'm saying mindset is so important is that the two elements of power uh, numbers and uh, and uh, uh, strength, innate strength, uh, don't matter if your mind is not ready for it. And I would say today the biggest uh, flaw in our country is our mindset. We, we really don't think the way we should because the British systematically prepared your mind. There are so many things that we know, we think about our history, which is, is it not factually correct. And it weakens you. Take this case of our history being of Aryans and Dravidians. You see, uh, the British created it. The word Aryan doesn't exist in any of our scriptures. It only Arya exists. Arya means for a accomplished, noble, uh, cultured person. In Tamil, we say Ayya, and uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in Sanskrit is Arya. So they went into Aryan. And Dravida is a word invented by Adi Shankara. When he went to Varanasi to challenge uh, Mandara Mishra to a debate. And because Mandara Mishra belonged to the uh, 
uh, Uttram Himsa school and he wanted to convert him to Hinduism. So those days that was the method, Shastra. You know, you had a debate. So they had a debate, Mandara Mishra and, uh, and uh, Shankara. And of course, Mandara Mishra is the greatest exponent of Uttram Himsa school. And uh, Shankara was the greatest exponent of uh, Hinduism. Who will be the umpire? So Shankara suggested uh, Mandra Mishra's wife. And that was fatal because she judged them a loser. Never appoint your wife as an umpire. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so uh, um, the first question Mandra Mishra's wife asked is, Who are you? So he said, I'm Dravida Shishu. And those who, I have not found a very convincing explanation for this, but those who have studied this, they say Dravida is a sandhi of two words, Tra and Vid, and it essentially means the southern coast, where three coasts meet, three oceans meet, and that is regional concept. It's not nothing to do with race. They cannot be now, we cannot believe that because the University of Cambridge, the Houston, you know, University of Houston, uh, some places in India, particularly in Mysore, all have studied DNA structure of Indians. And they have come to the conclusion that the frequency distribution is the same, the length and breadth of India. I mean, there will be some variations if you go to the corners of India, but the frequency distribution is the same. And it's got, you see, race has got nothing to do with color. This is one thing we have to get out of our mind. Color has got to do with pigmentation. Pigmentation has got to do with your exposure to sun. If you are closer to the equator, the sun is more direct in its attack on your skin. And, uh, and if you take your pigmentation out, you will become a white man, just like Michael Jackson became, you know, just about uh, the pigmentation and you look like a European. So, therefore, we Indians are the same, whether we are Brahmins or whether we are Shudras or whether we are Scheduled Khan, Dalit, whatever. Hindu or Muslim or Christian, the DNA is the same. So where did this question come up? And this was then converted into a political movement by, uh, by, by, the, by the British in the form of Dravida movement. And uh, as if Dravidas were the original inhabitants and the, uh, then the Aryans came from Europe and they drove them down to the south and so on and so forth. And much of it is based on bogus uh, new, uh, chronology. Uh, all our chronology that you read in textbooks in schools today is all bogus. Uh, in fact, Alexander came to India and he, he defeated uh, uh, Porus. Now, where is the record for that? The man, the chronicler who accompanied uh, Alexander Plutarch, it is his uh, chronicle. Now, what do you expect him to write that Alexander was defeated? There is no reference to Alexander in it. And whatever little uh, evidence there is in Sindh suggests that Alexander was defeated. And that's why he died as a broken man. Whether he suffered his first defeat. Before going, he told Socrates that I am going to India, I'll conquer India. And then I will take rest. So Socrates laughed. He said, I am already taking rest and you have to first go and conquer India and then become... Take rest. You can take rest now if you want. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the this, this distortion is tremendous. Karna Nidhi, whom of course I've never been politically on the same side, but we have uh, we know each other. We have had an interaction not recently after I sent his daughter to, the, to jail. <laughs> but, uh, but the fact is that uh, I've known him for years, and he argued with me. He told me how God is Ravan. And in fact, this Dravada movement people, there's, uh, many of their members call themselves as Ravana. Now, one day I told him Ravan is a, was a Brahmin. He couldn't believe it. He said, No, it's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> then I brought Kambad Ramayana and showed it to him. <laughs> I also told him. That, you know, Ravan went to, um, uh, to Kaila and uh, he uh, did uh, got Vara for, uh, from uh, Lord Shiva. He could call Shiva anytime he wanted. He couldn't believe that either. 
Now these people haven't studied. Uh, Karnataka is only fifth class pass, so I'm not surprised that they didn't know. <laughs> but uh, that's all right. It's a common thing in Sonia Gandhi. There's nothing wrong if you if you have if you feel that you should have had more education, you would have been like Tamara, who did the most for education in Tamil Nadu, despite being himself completely illiterate. You see. So um, it's uh, it is, it is the the, the uh, feigning of great knowledge, like Karna and he calls himself Kalinger and, uh, and Sonia to Gandhi for some time, at least till I exploded it, passed off, uh, her, that she was educated in the University of Cambridge when she wasn't there, there at, at, at all. So, they, I'm saying that they need to feel ashamed of not being educated, specialists recognize the importance of education. So, I have, in fact, when I, when the Chinese leaders, uh, much to the surprise of everybody, accepted my plea that Kailash and Mansarovar route should be reopened, which the communists had closed. Uh, Tan Xiaoping, who had received me at that time, he, he agreed and he said that I should uh, be the first one to go. So I agreed and I went. It was uh, very hard going in those days because it was, the route was being opened from th after 35 years. Uh, but on the way to Mansarovar, I saw a big lake uh, called uh, uh, Raman Haranga. So I asked the Tibetans, uh, the guides who had come with me, they were of course uh, uh, Chinese uh, employees, but anyway, I asked them, what is this, uh, why is it called Raman Haranga? I said, we don't know the name Raman, what meaning it has, but we do know Haranga means uh, in Tibetan, Sarovar. So Raman Sarovar. So I said, let me go and uh, says, uh, go here and see it. It's, it is a, actually a bigger lake than, than Mansarovar. So he said, no, no, but don't drink that water. So I said, why? He said, then God knows what will happen to you. Because it's pure, pure poisonous water. You can drink Mansarovar. He said, everything will be cured. You know, your stomach can, everything will be cured. But don't touch this water. So an evil thought crossed my mind. I filled a bottle full of uh, that Raman Hanga water. When I came back, I gave it to Karnanidhi. Uh, no, please, you drink it. <laughs> so, I'm saying that these are all these myths, you see. And people don't understand the power of religion in our country. Uh, one day, Karnanidhi got angry with me, saying that he, uh, that Swami says in the Supreme Court, Rama Setu. How is it Rama Setu? Did Ram build it? Does he have an engineering degree? Which engineering college he got a degree from? <laughs> to be, for it to be called Ram Setu? Next day he fell ill and he was admitted to Ram Chandra Medical Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote to him saying that at least he has got a BBS. <laughs> so I am saying that this kind of, uh, our minds have been completely dumb. We are like lions in that circus cage. And I have to come out of that. And uh, for coming out of that, if you want to get rid of stress, you have to go back to the basics. And you have to go to the basics, uh, you have to understand the circumstances which you just mentioned. There are many things which are said, which today people find abhorrent to even talk about. Take for instance the Varna, which the Westerners called as caste, because they are mixed up, because we make a distinction between Varna and Jati. Uh, jati has nothing to do except uh, where you are born and it's usually used for marriages and social uh, reasons. But Varna is a different matter, the fourfold division. It had nothing to do with birth. It has got degenerated and become birth based. Today the children of Brahmins say we are Brahmins and that's not automatic. When Bribu and Vardhavaja, two rishis, met together and decided that what's the best kind of society which minimizes stress? And he said that society is one where <coughs> uh, the competition is, is there along with cooperation. And that means there should be division. Everybody should not get everything. I mean, nobody should get everything. So, Bhrigu identified four sources of power which people desire. Knowledge, which is a very powerful thing. Two is weapons. Third is wealth. And
and fourth is land. So these four, he said that if somebody has all of it, then there will be stress in society. <coughs> so let there be division. Those who have knowledge will not have weapons, will not have wealth, will not have land. Those who have weapons cannot make policy. They will have to go to the learned to, for the policy. We were not monarchy in that sense. Monarchy means that the king could dispense justice, the king could de declare war. But in our scheme of things, the king did not have the power to declare war. He had to seek the permission and clearance of what was uh, the people with knowledge, which is called uh, Brahmins. So, uh, similarly, those who were, had wealth, they called the Vaisha caste, they were uh, permitted, they were encouraged. It was not infra deep to make money. But it would, did not guarantee you social status, the highest social, social status. The highest social status was given to the person who had knowledge, who was a knowledgeable person, who was an educated person, and he was a rishi. And finally those who had land would produce for the needs of society. There was a provision for pushing out of society those who committed some social crime. But their children were not part of that. They could not become children caste or uh, untouchable or whatever. Valmiki, for example, was born of, uh, of Dalit parents. But he became Maharishi. He wrote the Ramayana. The, similarly, Veda Vyasa was born of a, a fisherwoman. And he became Maharishi and he wrote the Mahabharata. So the Mahabharata and, the, and, uh, uh, and the Ramayana were not written by Brahmins. And then Vishwamitra was Rishi of Rishis. And he uh, was born in a Kshatriya family. His father and mother were Kshatriyas. Kalidasa was a hunter. Ravan was a Brahmin. <laughs> this a whole DK movement was founded on the grounds that we have to oppose the Brahmins and therefore Ravan is our God. <laughs> Turned out the sweet revenge that Ravan... Nowadays they don't speak about Ravan anymore. They only speak about disparaging Ram, but that won't last long either. Because in the end, Kranani will have to say, Ram, Ram, Sati, Hai. <laughs> so, anyway, the fact of the matter is that this was the original system. It got degenerated when it became birth. There was no inferiority or superiority in the forecast, except social status was given to those who pursued learning. Now, this idea first struck me when I came as a student to Harvard to get my PhD. My classmate told me, how can you make, accept Ra Mahatma Gandhi as your leader? So I asked him, why in America you will not accept him as a leader? He said, no, in America we will put him in jail for indecent exposure. <laughs> <laughs> now, that struck a thought in my mind. Why is it uh, that in India we go after people who are not properly dressed? Whereas in America, if you are not properly dressed, the best dressed, uh, you know, coat, tie, etc., you will not be a leader, you will not even qualify to be a leader. So there is what the concept of sacrifice, giving up, is extolled. I don't think you can find any other society where a person who starts giving up is revered. Today, Ramdev symbolizes the same thing. Anazare symbolizes the same thing. People automatically respect somebody who has nothing of his own. You should not find it in, a, in any other society. So, therefore, this globalization which is leading to greed, which is leading to corruption. Corruption's root is greed. And greed comes if pursuit of material Prosperity is a single dimensional goal for society. And it will not produce happiness. In America it does not produce happiness. So there has to be a balance. And the balance has to come through spiritual values. 
So consequently, the first principle I would tell you for stress management is don't measure yourself entirely by materialistic prosperity. But then you will see that uh, a change will come. That's why I talk about mindset. Mindset is an outlook. Outlook on what you have achieved. People very quickly judge themselves as failures because they, 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 their um, uh, standards are different. So you have to have a mindset as to what you want and what you pursue. And mindset is essentially the outlook on the events that unfold in your lifetime. All kinds of events unfold. Now, there is no other religion which has an explanation for the following obvious fact of life. In your lifetime, you can work for something for a long time and get nothing. Or without working, you can get a lot. In the same life, the same life. You may find that you are a brilliant person, very well qualified, but a complete duffer gets the position you want. Now ask the explanation. It happens in every society. Yeah. Huh? Don't think it doesn't happen here. It happens in every society. The only religion which has an explanation is Hinduism, which says that's the law of karma. The karma, accumulated karma, there's a karma calculus. And it is that karma calculus which it decides. So when your time, when the, when, uh, the rewards are not based on is not linearly connected with with your effort. That I put in X amount of effort, so I must get X amount of reward. No, it doesn't work that way. It is a accumulation of the total karma. So God works like a chartered accountant <laughs> who keeps a, a record of your karmas. And this comes from the authority uh, of the Gita. Now, let me just uh, read out in English uh, that uh, particular shloka, which I have taken from, uh, you can take any Gita book, but I was presented by Ganapati Sachidananda Swami. Now, that shloka comes in chapter 2, uh, in page, in chapter 2, the will give you the shloka number, so that you can refer to it later. It's uh, it's on uh, it's shloka number uh, forty-seven in chapter two of Bhagavad Gita. What Krishna says is, your right is to work only and never to its fruit. Let not the fruits of action be your motive. It can be your goal, by the way, but it cannot be your motive. Nor should you be attached to inaction because of that. In other words, what Krishna is saying is your freedom of action. Yeah. You have freedom of action, but you don't have a right to the result of that action. And the reward for that action will be given to you, but it will come as part of a general karma calculus. So you may get a very bad job and a very good wife, or a very bad wife and a very good job. I mean, there will be balancing going on. You can never tell. People ask me, why is it that you have not become Prime Minister yet? So I said, but I have become everything else. <laughs> there, there are people who have become Prime Minister that have been miserable. I think Manmohan Singh must be the most miserable man today <laughs> in India. He and I were professors together. He would have never dreamt of becoming Prime Minister. But he became Prime Minister because I, I wrote a letter to the President and the President then wrote a letter to Ms. Sonia Gandhi that he cannot make her a Prime Minister. So therefore he came in as a stopgap. He's lasted this long but he has lost his entire reputation in the process. So I, I don't think that, you know, we should look at it in these terms. You may have a goal, like, okay, I want to be Prime Minister, but if you don't become, 
You can't say I've been denied my right. That's where stress comes. If your stress is, I'll try for the for the moon, I'll try for the maximum. It comes fine. But I'll try for it. There's no bar. It doesn't say that you should become complete sannyasi goma and you know give up everything. No, you strive. You have your goal. But it can't be your motive. The driving force shouldn't be that. You want a goal, you want to achieve it. If you have that attitude and if you don't achieve it, don't take it to mean that you are a, you are a failure, you, there's something wrong with you, something some shortcoming in you. It may come later on. Do you know that Abraham Lincoln lost every election from the bottom up? He lost the corporate election. I think he even lost the dog catchers, uh, municipal, <laughs> uh, municipal commissions, uh, municipal councils, uh, the dog catchers post, which is an elected post. <laughs> he lost that. He lost councillors post. He lost congressmen's post. He lost the senate post. And he won the president of the uh, United States and became the greatest president. But it was his spirit. It didn't, it didn't dent him. Mohammed Ghori came how many times? I mean, we may not like him. <laughs> yeah, he came 16 times. See, and 17th time he, he established Islam in India. Mm -hmm. So th that means that there is a detachment between the attainment of the goal. You may keep that as your goal, but the attainment of it cannot be your motive. It can be your direction. It can be your your uh, uh, your target, but it cannot be. If you have that attitude, Krishna says in over and over again, then in the, indeed you will not be stressed. Stress is this, am I good enough? Am I, uh, uh, you know, will society treat me as a failure? Am I a failure? Now, uh, Krishna also tells you that in life how you should exercise your freedom of action. And that Drona also told uh, Arjuna. When Drona pulled his, the arrow to kill a bird, I mean when Arjuna pulled his arrow or the arrow to and the, the strings of the bow to shoot the arrow, Drona asked him, what do you see? He says, I see the iris of the eye of the bird and nothing else. And then Drona says, you are past. Shoot. Now that Ma Krishna has put in different words in Shloka number 41 in, uh, in chapter 2. Uh, let me see uh, what it says in English. Uh, Shloka number Ah, uh, In the practice of this yoga, O Arjuna, there is but a single one-pointed determination. Multifarious and innumerable are the decisions of the inform in mind. Don't clutter your mind with, I will do also this, I will also do this. When you go after something, nothing else should be in your mind. One single pointedness. So here is uh, two principles now suggested to you by Bhagavad Gita on how to reduce stress. One is that you work for a goal, but you are not attached to it. It comes, it's fine, it doesn't come fine, you blame it on your karma. Or you blame it on God, because He doesn't know how to use the calculus of karma properly. Uh, something, but don't blame yourself. Provided you have done your best. The second thing is your mind should not waver. Uh, I will have also a vacation, I will also, you know, go and see a cinema and all that. If you are studying, your mind should be only on passing the exam with flying colors. That single-pointedness comes throughout the Bhagavad Gita. 
Your mind should be riveted to that objective. And you can't get it once, then try again, try again, and try again. Maybe uh, Muhammad uh, uh, Ghazni, uh, Gori was a secret, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> Bhagavad Gita. Then, <clears throat> third thing which they, they say, which is you have to practice that, that's not easy. And that is Krishna's, uh, Krishna telling in Shloka number 38 of chapter 2 again. Uh, chapter 2 and one other chapter, maybe chapter uh, uh, 16 are very important. Uh, this is uh, 38. Uh, yes. What it says is, lava, lava, etc., etc. I'll put a read in English. Treating alike pain and pleasure, gain and loss, victory and defeat, engage yourself in battle, thereby you will not incur sin. Now that's not easy, but I have found in my life that if you don't get unduly excited by victory, if you are not unduly depressed by defeat, I've uh, won five elections, I've lost two, but uh, the first time I lost it was devastating because I had won three in a row and then lost one. And then Mrs. Indira Gandhi was assassinated and everybody lost, so I also lost. Once I lost because of the electronic voting machine, it's not my defeat, but still, on paper it's defeat. Chidambaram was defeated, but he was elected on paper. <laughs> so, I mean, those things can happen, but still, it didn't make me angry that I was the best. Nor when I won by the largest majority after the emergency, I won by the huge majority. I was assumed that if this present mood continues against corruption in the next election, I'll win by a huge majority again. But it won't bother me. Because over the years I have trained. This is not something you can get today. You can't make a resolution and it happened tomorrow. It takes time. But I can say 100% that stress is minimized if you can somehow moderate your reactions to defeat and victory, pain, pleasure, bad news, good news, these extreme opposites. And if you can do that, then stress will definitely be completely minimized. So, uh, many people ask me, what is it, uh, you know, uh, how is it that you don't show any stress? Well, of course, jokingly I say I give stress to others, so uh, nothing is left for me. But, uh, but the fact is that over the years, thanks to Paramacharya, I mean, the, the great God uh, in human form, uh, I had the great uh, privilege of being in frequent contact with him uh, for seven years from 1977 to 1984. When he made an exception in my case and would give me instructions on politics and what you could do, what you could do. In that process, the one thing he did, kept saying, you know, it doesn't matter what results come, you just keep on doing. Actually, that is important. And not uh, whether you have won, now you can rest and, you know, rule, uh, and, you know, now say I've done all that I have to do. No, you just keep doing, keep doing. And that uh, is uh, this, this ability to moderate your emotions between the defeat and victory. This is key to stress. I must tell you, stress has today become one of the biggest killers. And if you go back to 2007 Business Week, there's a whole two-page article in Business Week, which I think now has been taken over by Bloomberg, I think. Uh, that, I don't think it's called Business Week anymore, it's called Bloomberg's, uh, or maybe it's still called Business Week, but it's owned by Bloomberg. In that, there were two pages where they said they were lo the corporates were worried losing executives at their prime age due to heart failure. And they traced it to stress. The stress produces chemicals in your body. And that settles in your heart arteries. So, therefore, there should be no stress. 
and they began by teaching bhagavad gita today that's the new undercurrent which many people don't realize like yoga suddenly yoga has sprouted on the scene today yoga can be taught in any you can see it being taught in any small town the next thing that will spread i'm telling you in another 10 years will be sanskrit because bush had already seen that and he had announced the special scholarships because artificial intelligence it has been decided will be conducted the research will be conducted in sanskrit the storage of knowledge will be in sanskrit so there are so these things which we have but we don't realize that we have these treasures we have to use it so i would say the 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 thing that you must do this there's a professor of stanford recently who wrote a book called she is her name is carol dweck and she's in a book called mindset it you, you can buy you can get it it's produced uh, published by random house in which she classifies mindset into two types fixed and growth mindsets and she says the successful people ultimately successful people in society are those who have growth mindsets and not those who have fixed mindsets for instance if you take the view uh that i have my limits i fail because i'm a failure then you have a fixed mindset if you have a growth mindset you'll say well i fail but I, that means i have not been able to exercise my full potential and hence i would uh now try again now if i fail uh it, uh the gita has already said it in all it is in uh in a number of shlokas and chapter 16 uh if you read chapter 16 i think fully you will be able to get uh the uh, let me see if i can read one or two uh so chapter 16 fearlessness purity of mind steadfastness this is uh, the first shloka of chapter 16 fearlessness purity of mind steadfastness in knowledge yoga charity control of senses sacrifice spiritual study austerity straight forwardness etc then it goes on other qualities non injury truth absence of anger serenity absence of vilification modesty absence of fickleness fickleness is something which we uh, we all all of her uh once uh, there was a well known politician many 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 years ago called pratap singh kerala was the he got a degree from berkeley went back and became chief minister of punjab so one day he was speeding along on the road from delhi to chandigarh and there was a friend of his and one one uh, hen came across the road he stopped in the middle and the car killed it so the other fellow was a bit religious type he said mama we have, we have committed sin the driver could have gone slow and so on so forth so pratap singh said, said no 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 speed did not kill the uh, uh, hen it was the hen's confusion whether to go forward or backward <laughs> that killed it and he just stood the ground there you know not knowing whether to go forward or backward so it is the indecision which kills and that is one thing that comes out so i would say go on reading chapter singh and i would uh, 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 urge you slowly read all of this chapter 16 and you will get all the qualities you need to get rid of stress so that bring me uh to the main point stress arises out of what it arises out of anxiety anxiety about things which are not in your control suppose i start off from my house i got a very important appointment maybe i'm going to get a top job and i'm being interviewed for it i start off and there's a big traffic jam and the time fixed for the appointment i cannot meet so uh, in this country appointments and punctuality is very very important so you start stressing you can't do anything it's not your fault now what happens is that if you took a positive attitude maybe this is for your good i know one friend who fretted 
for two days because in a traffic jam you could not keep an appointment and lost a big contract. Two days later, he got even bigger contract, which he could not have had if he had agreed to the first contract. Uh, get rejected for Stanford and then get accepted for Harvard. You know, they, they, I've seen this happen. So I would say this, these events, where they are outside your control, when they are beyond your control, then of course you have to take an even attitude. You go to the airport, you are stuck five hours, you don't curse the airline for it. Just sit and, you know, have a good nap or something. But you have to develop that attitude. But unfortunately we Indians have one big, big disease in our mind called what if? <laughs> People to ask me what if in the end all these criminals come out free from courts? So I, why should I worry about that? It's going a long way off. In the beginning they asked me what if the Supreme Court rejects your petition? Well the Supreme Court didn't reject my petition. Now what if nothing happens? Well, lots of people started going to jail. More are going to jail. Then Anidhi Maru will go next month. After that, Chidambaram will go. And if Raja is gone, then some Rani must go too. If it's a Dili, if it's a Tamil Raja, then a Dili Rani must go. So, I mean, they are asking me. When I was fighting the emergency, I came to America because Jay Prakash Narayan and the RSS leader, the mother of Mule, he felt, they felt, what is the use of your being in underground in India? Nobody knows what you are saying. There is so much censorship. So you go to America, because America you know very well. And you campaign there, it comes on Voice of America, comes on BBC, everybody will listen. <laughs> so I came here, one question everybody asked, how will this emergency go? What if it doesn't go, what will you do? I said, I'll go old uh, fighting the emergency, but I'll st uh, I'm going to continue. But I have no answer. How will this emergency go? I don't know. How did the emergency go? Indira Gandhi declared the election and she lost the election. Now, could I have foreseen that? Till one, if I had even told people one day Indira Gandhi will declare the election and then she will lose it, they would have thought I have lost my mind instead. You see. <laughs> How can it be possible Indira Gandhi will lose the election? Same way today on the war against corruption. No, no, no. In the beginning they said nothing will happen. It's all drama. Ultimately now there is a lot of excitement. Now they have gone to the other extreme. Isko kyun nahi pakda? Isko kyun nahi pakda? You know, why is the Ambani's out? Why are the, these people out? Why is the Purjavan in? <laughs> now it's a it's a very tough task you see because when I go to court the room is not bigger than this this is a trial court you know I'm not talking about the Supreme Court I'm talking about the trial court trial court is only big as big as this and we have got already 23 accused all top people they bring in each of them bring 10 lawyers there are 250 lawyers you know, screaming away and I and the CBI alone standing here, you see. I must say the judge is very good, so he, he doesn't bend easily. But he also we are benefited by the public mood. But this uh, feeling of getting defeated even before the battle starts. British will never go away. This is now none of you will remember this. Read Times of India editorial of 1944. I think it was the month was June and the date was 21st. What did it say? Gandhi is a joker. He has made a mess because the Quit India movement had failed. It was, it was, and Britain, Britain was winning the war. So everybody thought, oh, now Britain, uh, Churchill will become re-elected Prime Minister and Britain will continue to rule India for a thousand years, which is what the British were saying. What happened? Britain, uh, Churchill was defeated in the election. And Adley was elected. Who could have foreseen that? So this mentality which is causes maximum stress in the Indian mind is, what if? <laughs> this you must wear out from. No talk about what if. I am working for this goal. 
and that's all I see, nothing else. Like Drona asked uh, Arjuna, that is what you have to have. So I would say that this question is, this, when, this, when you ask me about stress management, I can say that it is the anxiety which causes stress, and anxiety arises because of your mind, you are constantly thinking of what if, what if. What if I get married and after getting married, the, my child is born with a twisted nose and she can't get married, what will I do then? We don't think like that. There's no what if. Life is a question of taking risks. Risk aversion is an Indian problem. I asked my students at Harvard at the end of the term, when this term gets over on the first week of August, now when you go, what kind of job will you look for? I said you can become a businessman, start your own firm, become a billionaire, or you can fall flat on your face, there's a depression that comes in, or an economic slide that comes in, and your company goes bankrupt and you're out on the street. Whether you would prefer that kind of a job where you can either be a billionaire or, <coughs> or be on the street, or another job where you join a government office and your salary is fixed when you join, then every year 500 rupees will go up and the age of 60 you will get provident fund and you can build a house in Bangalore and retire. You know, they, they, this kind of job. Now, the American students will all ask me, what's the probability that I'll fall flat on my face? What's the risk there? 90% of the students will say, I want the first job. When I tell them, but that is guaranteed poverty, why do you want that? They said, at least it is, it is guaranteed, that is why we want it. <laughs> that mentality, we Indians have to get rid of. You got to take risk. And if you got to take risk, you can't have anxiety. What will be the outcome? What if this happens? What if that happens? No. This is precisely what Gita tells you. You have freedom, essentially, uh, essentially, for you have freedom, essentially, for action. This, what? How do I then decide what to do? Here again, Krishna's last shloka on chapter sixteen, in chapter sixteen, shloka twenty-four, uh, which I'll read out. He concludes that chapter, the chapter concludes as follows. Ignoring the ordinances of the scriptures, he who acts under the impulsion of desire does not attain perfection or happiness or even his supreme goal. Therefore, the scripture is your authority in deciding what is to be done, what is not to be done. Knowing what is ordained by the scripture, you perform your duty. So, if there is a dharma, you have to fight it. It doesn't matter what the consequences are. If there is corruption, you have to oppose it. You can't think of what will happen, I will be ruined, this will be that. You got to fight. Of course you got to fight intelligently. You must acquire the, the skills of fighting. You can't just go uh, tomorrow go and decide how to fight. You have to organize and so on. So, broadly speaking, I will conclude by saying that what our Hindu values teaches us, no other, no other religion teaches you. Other religions may say, get yourself killed and go upstairs and you will find lots of lovely girls there. <laughs> One religion may say that, another religion may say something else. But this blueprint for action is there only in the Hindu religion which tells you how to control stress. That is why today, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, Ramdev, or Dayanand Saraswati, all their ashrams are full, full of uh, foreigners, rich foreigners. And you find rich people here converting to Hindu point of view, or at least accepting the Hindu concept. Because there you will find, if you study it properly, the scriptures as Krishna says, all the prescriptions are there. And the fundamentals I have already told you. 
So, what sort of person must you be free? To, must you be to be stress free? I would say, first of all, you must develop your intelligence, which is unbounded intelligence. Unfortunately, everybody thinks intelligence means cognitive intelligence, which means how much physics you know, how much mathematics you know, how much you know, MBA, uh, how much business management you know. There's only one. Our Shastras, our uh, Vipanishads have long told, now of course in modern form which is being taught at Harvard, that besides cognitive intelligence, there is something called emotional intelligence. How to manage your emotions. Then there is social intelligence. That your intelligence, that in your pursuit of your personal goals, the social goals are also harmonized. Then there is a moral intelligence. To pursue without causing any moral wrong. Then there is something which is the most difficult of all, which is what temples are for, which is all the Swamiji's are for, and that's called spiritual intelligence. And spiritual intelligence is when you are able to connect with the cosmos. Knowledge is there in the cosmos. If you want to become an Einstein, if you want to become a great thinker, or you want to find a solution to a problem, your mind, if it is, can meditate on the cosmos, the neural Wi-Fi, as the, as, the, as the modern books in America say, which you can see by going to the internet, the Goldman has written it, and many others have written this. This spiritual intelligence development is the most important. And that's what Sanatana Dharma has said from beginning, that to be truly happy, you must have a harmonization of material progress with spiritual advancement. So the ultimate goal for a Hindu is the spiritual attainment. But the material progress is necessary as a means to an end and the, the two have to be married together. Then only you can be genuinely stress-free, otherwise you will be a, a casualty in some hospital at some stage in your life. Thank you very much.